Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Well, hello and welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. Well, today we're studying in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. You know, the Bible tell, tells pastors, it commands us to read and explain the scripture. So that's just what we're doing. So we're studying the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Um, last time we studied Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 22. And because this is such a long and rich book, we broke this one up into two. So Today we're studying Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin with uh, verse 23. Now this chapter is often referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame. The writer of Hebrews is presenting examples of Old Testament saints who held to their faith in God despite their uh, great opposition that they faced and great hardships that they had to endure, great persecution. The, the goal of the writer of Hebrews is to encourage these Hebrew saints uh, who, who lived in the beginning of the New Testament. They lived uh, uh, during the first century period, and they were under great uh, persecution. He wanted to give them examples of, of their ancestors uh, who lived in the Old Testament times, uh, these great cloud of witnesses who held on to their faith despite great persecution and hardships. They stayed faithful. They overcame opposition. Uh, they won the victory through faith in God. Now, uh, so the writer of Hebrews is giving this long list uh, of the faithful to encourage them to follow that same example. So let's jump right into our study. Uh, I'm reading as usual in the New Living Translation, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. It was by faith that Moses' his parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. Throughout this entire chapter, the writer of Hebrews has been giving us examples of people who use their faith to obey God and to gain a good reputation or a good testimony. Uh, the King James says a good report. Now, by faith, Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, refused to comply with the unjust uh, uh, laws of Egypt that demanded that they hand their their uh, firstborns, their sons, any any male children that were born to the Hebrew slaves were to be handed over to the government for execution. Um, while many of the Israelites were, were uh, forced to obey this law, um, they hid their children. Moses' parents uh, hid him. Um, they hid him and they kept him hidden as long as they, as they could because they knew that Moses was a special gift from God and their faith in God overcame their fear of the king. Now, when they could uh, no longer hide him, they, they were finally forced to put him in a little ark, a little boat, and put him in the Nile River. Uh, and they prayed, of course, and, and, and he floated down the Nile uh, River. And by God's providence, the very daughter of Pharaoh found Moses and adopted him and raised him. Now I'm reading verses 24 through 26. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He, cho he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. But he was looking ahead to his great reward. Now, sometimes our faith compels us to make hard choices. Although Moses was adopted by the princess, uh, he knew he was not an Egyptian. Uh, he knew he was a, a Hebrew, an Israelite. And he evidently had been told about God and about the Hebrew people um, and, and the covenant promises that God had given to them. So he made the choice to embrace his Hebrew heritage and not to be a sellout. Uh, he sacrificed to be with his people and to follow God. He embraced his, his oppressed people and their God and chose to suffer with them rather than to enjoy the sinful pleasures of Egyptian royalty for a few years before dying and leaving it all. So uh, his faith assured him that there was something better, something beyond this world 
um, uh, and something better than, than what this world had to offer. Moses had enough insight to know that this life was very short, that the rewards of heaven were eternal. Now, Moses' suffering aligned him with the suffering of Christ, who was promised to come and bring blessings to the world. Uh, Christ was in Moses' distant future. The Israelites would not see him for some time, but Moses trusted. Now I'm reading verses 27, uh, verse 27. It was by faith that Moses led the, left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Now Moses displayed great courage in defending the Hebrews, but he was somewhat confused. He assumed that his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. You can read about that in Acts chapter 7. Now, he thought that God would use him to deliver the, the Hebrews from Egyptian uh, bondage, but when he killed a, uh, an Egyptian and tried to rally the Hebrews to follow him, uh, he was acting actually ahead of God's timing. It was, uh, he was disappointed uh, when things didn't work out as he had thought they would, uh, but he didn't lose faith in God. Even though he lived in exile, he had to run away and live in exile for 40 years, uh, God finally spoke to him and sent him back uh, to Egypt to free his people. Now, although he ran away to escape being executed by the, uh, uh, by the king of Egypt for killing the, uh, the Egyptian who was mistreating uh, a Hebrew slave, Moses would return 40 years later and, and boldly face down Pharaoh and demand that, uh, with God's backing, he would demand that Pharaoh release the Hebrew slaves from slavery. His faith was revealed through his courage, and our faith is revealed through our courage when we determine to stand for God despite opposition. Now I'm reading verse 28. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn son. Now, after 40 years in the wilderness, fast forward 40 years in Moses' life, God sent Moses back to Egypt to demand the release of the Hebrew slaves. Now, after going back and forth with Pharaoh, God, uh, God rained down plagues on Egypt, and uh, 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 Pharaoh would, uh, under the plagues, the weight of the plagues, he would relent and say that he's going to allow the people to go. Uh, but then once the uh, plagues were lifted, he would change his mind uh, and, and would not let them go. So after a back and forth of that, about nine or uh, ten plagues that uh, God rained down the, on them, about nine plagues, uh, God finally told Moses that he was going to, to drop one last plague on Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and they would be glad to let the, uh, the Hebrews go. God told him that an angel would visit every home in Egypt and, and kill the firstborn uh, of anyone who did not sprinkle blood on the doorpost uh, of a, uh, the blood of a young lamb on the, on the doorpost of their homes. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 20. So Moses acted in faith and commanded the Israelites to sprinkle the blood to save themselves. The Israelites acted in faith and, and, and each family sprinkled the blood of a lamb on the doorpost. Of course, the Egyptians did not act in faith, either because... They were not told uh, or just because they did not believe. Uh, the firstborn son in every Egyptian home was killed that night by the death angel as he passed through looking for the blood. Um, and Pharaoh finally released the Hebrews from slavery and they marched out of Egypt, headed to the promised land. Now, the Hebrews were commanded to commemorate this event as a holy day. They called it the Passover because the death angel passed over the homes of those who had placed a blood, a sprinkle of blood on the doorposts. Uh, that lamb that was killed and bled was a figure of Christ who would come hundreds of years later uh, and shed his own blood to save the world. Now I'm reading verse 29. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the, the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. Now, on their way to the promised land, the Israelites came upon the Red Sea. Uh, God told Moses to hold up his, his uh, rod or his staff uh, and divide the waters. 
by, uh, by faith, Moses believed God. He did what God said. He held up his, 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 his staff and, and the waters, God responded and opened up the waters on both sides. And the Israelites were, were able to, to walk through on dry ground. Now, God commanded the Israelites to go through, and by faith they did. Now, it was a very frightening thing to walk in between two huge swells of water, two huge walls of water that were being held up supernaturally by God. They, they, uh, the Israelites had to, had to trust God um, because it took hours for them, uh, two or three million people to, to go through that, um, that Red Sea on dry ground, uh, but uh, but uh, herding their livestock and pulling their wagons and taking all their belongings. So many people had to go through. It took a long time, so they had to trust God as they went through uh, between those wa walls of water. Now, Pharaoh and his armies decided to recapture the Israelites. Um, they thought about the fact that slavery was the backbone of their e economy, and so their economy would, would collapse without the uh, slave labor, that free labor that they had. Uh, and, and so they decided they were going to recapture and re-enslave the people. So they, they um, pursued them right down. They had the audacity, Pharaoh and his army, to pursue them right down in uh, uh, between the walls of water, down into the Red Sea, defying God who was holding up the water. And of course, God released the water upon them uh, and they all drowned in the Red Sea. Now I mean verse, uh, verse 30. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. So now we're leaving the book of Exodus. This is 40 years, fast forward 40 years from the time that they uh, um, left uh, Egypt and they were wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of uh, their disobedience. They fell into disobedience. So God uh, allowed them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all of those rebels had died off, and now they were encroaching the land. They were getting ready to go. They crossed the Jordan River, and now they were going into the promised land. Forty years after leaving Egypt, they entered the promised land. And the first wicked city they they were commanded to conquer after they crossed the Jordan and, and entered uh, the land was Jericho. The people of Jericho had heard about God and Israel, and they were afraid. Uh, they had locked themselves inside of their city that had these great walls uh, impregnable. Uh, and so God instructed the Israelites just to march around the city for seven days. The, the first six days, they were to march around silently and they were to be quiet, not say a word. Well, on the seventh day, they were to march around and they were to shout and blow the shofar. Now, uh, the Israelites obeyed this, even though it didn't make sense to them. Uh, they trusted God and they did exactly what he said. Uh, and on that seventh day, the walls of Jericho came uh, crashing down. Now, this is in the book of, uh, we're going now into uh, the book of Joshua. Now, it was by faith that Rahab, uh, verse 31 I'm reading. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Now, faith, I remind you, is believing God's promises enough to act in obedience to them. Believing God's promises and acting to obey him. Now, Rahab was a prostitute who lived in the city of Jericho, this wicked city. Though she had lived a sinful life all her life, she made the decision to side with God, believing that God would destroy uh, her city she acted in faith and, and uh, hid the, the Israelite spies that secretly came into the city. Now, by faith, Rahab recognized God as the God of heaven and the God of earth. You can read about that in Joshua chapter 2, verse 18, where that is, that is stated about her. She asked the Israelites to spare her and her family when God gave the city to them. She believed that God was going to destroy this city and destroy uh, her people. And so she brought her family into her home. She asked them to spare her because she believed in God. Uh, and, and they agreed if she, she and her family were inside the house and they were to hang, out, uh, to hang a red cord out the window so that when they took the city, 
They would see that red cord. Here we are, something red that symbolizes the blood of Christ again. Uh, and, and they would pass over her and they would spare her. Now, this same Rahab ended up uh, marrying into the family of Judah because when they took the city, they spared her, uh, her and her family. And she ended up marrying into the family of Judah and, and becoming a direct ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ who would come to save the whole world for, uh, from, from our sins with his blood. Uh, she's in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. You can see that. Rahab's life is a reminder that we all have a past uh, and that God is willing to forgive the sins of our past and, and to give us a future uh, if we place our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord in sincere faith uh, will be forgiven of their sins and, and saved and given a new life and a new future. Rahab the harlot is a, is a perfect example of how God can transform our lives, cover our sins with the blood of Jesus Christ, and give us a new life and a new future. Now I'm reading verse 32. How much more do I need to say? It, uh, it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. So uh, as we go forward, uh, in, in the scriptures, we, we, we started with Exodus and Moses, and, and now we've gone into Joshua. Uh, and, and now uh, the writer is, is uh, quoting heroes, speaking of heroes who were in the books of Judges and, and uh, First and Second Samuel, and then uh, First and Second Kings uh, as we're going forward. Now, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel were all heroes of Israel uh, who, although they had flaws, distinguish themselves by acting in faith to obey God. The writer is encouraging the Hebrews and us uh, in our time, uh, the Hebrew saints and us, the saints of, 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 of the New Testament, the latter New Testament saints, to seize their moment in time and to, to follow the example of this long list of heroes, this great cloud of witnesses of the faith, and to determine to act in faith and obey God in their own time. Uh, we now are living in our time and we have to make faith choices if we want to have a good report, if we want to finish our course, finish the race, um, and hear God say, well done. Uh, if we want to make our mark in history for God, we have to obey him as well in faith. Now I'm reading verses 33 through 35. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Now, faith is believing God's promises and acting to obey him. I keep reiterating that because there are people running around here today saying they have, they have faith and they're not doing anything that God says, okay? So if we really believe God, we're going to act and prove it. We're going to demonstrate it by the way we conduct ourselves. Now, by faith, men like Joshua and David overthrew wicked kings. By faith, good kings like David and Josiah and, and Hezekiah and a few others uh, ruled with justice. They refused to corrupt themselves, uh, and, and they received what God had promised them. Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land, overthrowing the wicked people of Canaan and dispossessing them and receiving the land that God had promised to them so long ago. Now, by faith, they, uh, Daniel and David and, and Samson stopped the mouths of lions. Daniel was delivered from the lion's den. David and Samson killed lions. By faith, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, uh, and Abednego, quenched the violence of fire after they were thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar for their faith in God. They defied the king. They would not bow to his image, and so they were thrown into the furnace, and God caused them to quench the violence of fire. The fire did not affect them. Um, by faith, Esther, uh, her faith, uh, all the Jews were in exile under the Medes and the Persians, 
Um, but they escaped death because of Esther's faith and and uh, a man, her uncle named Mordecai, um, they stood in faith. And so uh, this wicked man, Haman, who, who hatched a plan to destroy all of their people, uh, was hanged himself. And all the Jewish people were saved from the sword because of their faith. Uh, now we've, we've moved into the book of Esther. Now verse 34 says, by faith their weaknesses was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Gideon, we go back to Gideon. Gideon comes to mind here. He was strengthened by God to destroy the Midianites, the enemies of Israel who were robbing and, and oppressing them during the time of the, the judges. By faith, women received their loved ones uh, back from death. The great prophets Elijah and Elisha uh, come to mind here. Both these prophets raised boys from death and brought them back to life, young boys uh, who died and, and their mothers were in distress, uh, and they prayed for these boys and brought them back to, let, to, to life again. And you can read about uh, the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. You can read about the prophet Elisha, the successor of Elijah, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, verse 35 tells us that by faith, some of the old saints accepted being tortured uh, and killed rather than, de de than denying their faith in God to escape their persecution. These were strong and courageous people who had made up their minds uh, that they would not deny their, their, their God just to save their lives here on earth. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Now I'm reading verses 36 through 38. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing, sheep, or wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Now, the writer of Hebrews now chronicles the terrible suffering and unjust treatment of, of faithful saints of the Old Testament and how they endured uh, such treatment for their faith in God. The writer emphasizes how they did not abandon their faith to escape their suffering. So, uh, so they were, uh, he says, he gives a list of the things that they suffered. He says, number one, some were jeered at. And their backs were cut open with, with whips. Uh, others were chained in prisons. Uh, some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Now, tradition has it that the prophet Isaiah was one of the ones who was sawn in half uh, for his faith in God. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. Verse 38 indicates that they became homeless, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and in holes in the ground. These people were, were became destitute and homeless, not because um, they didn't work and accumulate goods, but because of their faith, their goods were taken from them. Their homes were taken from them and, and their goods was confiscated. These are some of the things that were happening to the Hebrew saints uh, in the early New Testament that, Paul, that the, the writer of Hebrews uh, is writing to, to encourage. They're suffering some of these same things. So uh, the writer is going back to their ancestors in the Old Testament and, and holding them up as examples uh, of those who stood in faith and, and received the prize, received the, uh, the blessings of God, a good report. Now, the King James Version includes in this suffering the, that they were tempted. Every Christian has experienced temptation. We all know the pain and the disappointment of failing temptation, uh, and we know the triumph of resisting and overcoming temptation. It's reasonable to include temptation as one of the many uh, instruments of pain and discouragement that Satan used against the ancient saints because he uses these same things against us. Now, although the world uh, didn't see their value, verse 38 of the text says that they were too good for this world. The world was not worthy of them, but God knew their value and he rewarded them. Now, despite this kind of intense suffering and persecution, these saints dug in 
Uh, they doubled down and stayed faith, uh, uh, stayed faithful and obedient to God and refused to give up their faith in him. Uh, the writer is urging the Hebrew saints and us to follow their example and abandon any thought about turning away from Christ to Judaism or something else to avoid suffering and persecution. Now I'm reading verses 39 through 40, and we'll finish this chapter. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Now, it's important to note that all these people earned a good reputation or a good testimony or a good report because they believed God's promises and acted to obey him, refusing to turn away from God. It's also important to realize that uh, none of them received everything that God promised. They received some, uh, some things, some of the things that God promised, but, but uh, the most valuable and the most important things they died looking forward to. Uh, the most important thing that God promised them was the coming of Christ and his work of salvation and redemption on the cross. These saints died in hope of that, looking forward to the promise of the coming Messiah. They died before he came, but they died in faith and, ex and, and expectancy. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were promised certain things from God. These are some of the, uh, let me uh, read this passage from Genesis chapter 12 to you, and it includes the promises uh, that, that God made to Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and verse 7 says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your native country, your, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I will give this land to your descendants. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through, 1 through 3 and 7. Now, the promises that God made to Abraham and his descendants are as follows. Number one, I will make you into a great nation. Number two, I will bless you uh, and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. Number three, he says, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who treat you with contempt. Uh, number four, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And number five, I will give this land to your descendants. Again, that's Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three and seven. Now, God later repeated an important part of the covenant promises and gave Abraham more clarity. In Genesis chapter 22 and 18, he said, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, God's promise to Abraham and his descendants included old covenant promises and new covenant promises. But God's new covenant promises was specifically that through Abraham's seed, all of the families of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 22, 18 and Paul picked it up again in Galatians 3 and 16. So God did fulfill the promises of the old covenant to the people who lived in the Old Testament times. He gave Abraham and Sarah a son, and through that son came many descendants. They received the promised land of Canaan and, and became a great nation. God blessed those who blessed them, cursed those who cursed them. But during Old Testament times, God did not fulfill the promises of the new covenant with its better promises that the writer of Hebrews has been stressing and defending all of this time, all the way throughout. Now, verse 40 of our text says, God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. God promised Abraham that in his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's the heart of the new covenant promise with something better for us. All the families of the earth began being blessed when Christ came into the world, fulfilled the demands of the law and the old covenant and ushered in the new covenant with its better promises. The better promises that God had, had, had uh, prepared is Christ and the new covenant. He brought it with its, with its better promises when Christ came into the earth. God didn't give it to them then because 
He wanted to include us. His plan was to wait for just the right time in history to bring Christ and the new covenant into the world. Paul says that specifically in Galatians 4 and 4. Now, the Old Testament saints looked forward to the coming of Christ, but they passed into heaven before he came. Now that he has come, we, New Testament saints, look back at what he has done for us all. We, along with them, are sharing in the better blessing that Christ has brought. They in heaven with Christ and us still on earth but joined with Christ and sharing in his blessings and benefits and waiting for him to return. Now, the new covenant promise is that all the families of the earth will be blessed in Abraham's seed, meaning Christ. Some details of this promise were scattered throughout the Old Testament and spoken of by the various prophets. More of these details were, were revealed to us through the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, different prophets talked about Christ and his coming and the blessing that it would bring upon the earth. And then more details were revealed to us through the New Testament writings. Christ and his apostles explained them to us in detail through the Gospels, through the Epistles, through the Book of Acts and the Book of Revelation. And through these writings, we, we better understand the specific details of the blessings that Christ brought to all the families of the earth. We who are believers are experiencing the partial fulfillment of that promise that all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ. We are blessed because of what Christ has done in our lives. Through Christ, God promised to us these following blessings. Number one, to save us from our sins. Number two, to forgive us of our sins and free us from slavery to sin. Number three, to write his laws in our hearts. Number four, to give us new life and make us uh, new creature, creatures or creations in Christ Jesus. Number five, to come in and fellowship with us. Now, God fulfilled those promises through the sacrifice of his son and by giving us the Holy Spirit who lives in us, teaching us, guiding us, constraining and compelling us, and bringing us up to our memory what Jesus Christ has said to us through his word. Now, Paul affirmed the fulfillment of these new covenant promises with these words. And I'm quoting Titus chapter 2. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. That's Titus 2, 14 in the New Living Translation. Paul went on to say, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. That's Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7 in the New Living Translation. Now, in his letter to the Philippians, Paul wrote these words. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Philippians 2, 13. Now, confirming our freedom from slavery to sin, Paul wrote these words. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we've given to you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. Romans 6, 17 in the New Living Translation. And confirming the fulfillment of the promise of cleansing us from sin and giving us the new birth and eternal life, the apostle Peter wrote these words. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. That's 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 uh, and, um, uh, in the New Living Translation. Now, we enjoy a partial fulfillment of the promise that Christ uh, and all the, that through Christ, all the families of the earth would be blessed. When Jesus comes back to earth again, the second time, and sets up his kingdom here on earth, we will see the total fulfillment of all of the promises that God made when he said, through Christ, all the families of the, of the earth would be blessed. Now, we will see the full the total fulfillment of the promises, and, and these are the promises that are encompassed in, in that statement, in that uh, promise uh, of the new covenant. Number one, 
Well, we will see the restoration of this earth to a paradise like it was in the beginning, and even better. Number two, the promise of the rule of Christ on earth. Number three, the promise of peace on earth, goodwill to men, uh, peace even in the animal world. Number four, the promise of new, perfect, sinless, glorified bodies like the body of Jesus, okay? Number five, the promise of immortality and eternal life. And number six, the promise of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven uh, to earth. Now, these and many other wonderful promises are still ahead of us. But any day now, Christ will break through the clouds, catch us away with him, and we will begin to enjoy the best blessings of the new covenant that Jesus brings to us. Now, this is why the writer of Hebrews urged the Hebrew saints and us to fix our gaze upon heaven and, and uh, the lives of the great cloud of witnesses, the saints of old, who uh, held on to their faith despite hardship and difficulty. And because they kept their faith in God, they won the victory and obtained a good report. They kept their eyes on the prize. They fought the good fight. They finished the race. They remained faithful and they received the prize. These were words of encouragement to the Hebrew saints and us, uh, the Hebrew saints in their day and to us in our day. And we should continue to look forward and follow the example of the saints of the Old Testament. Well, that brings us to the close of Hebrews chapter 11. Next time we will cover chapter 12. I want to invite you to tune in to our services at New Direction Church, where my son, Kenneth Sullivan Jr., is the senior pastor, and he's doing a wonderful job of leading the church. Now, during COVID pandemic, well, we live stream our services on, on Sundays at 8.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., and on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Uh, and you can find these services at ndcbetterlife.org. Please join us for services. Now until next time, may God bless you and keep you safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com.